This is the recording for the Intermittent Compression Devices Lecture for PTA 103 Modalities course. Compression devices require a couple different things for this. We can look at edema, the presence of abnormal amounts of extracellular tissue space fluid. Joint swelling, which is blood and joint fluid accumulated immediately following injury appearance and feeling of like a water balloon effect and lymphedema, which is swelling in the subcutaneous tissue, usually from excessive collection of lymph. Purpose of the lymphatic system is mainly to help proteins escape small blood vessels are picked up by the lymphatic system, return to the blood circulation, and then flush out of the system at the heart. The lymphatic sac is a safety valve for fluid overload that a local sudden increase in the interstitial fluid causes pitting a deep. It also maintains the homeostasis of the extracellular environment by removing excessive protein molecules and waste from the interstitial fluid. It cleanses the interstitial fluid and provides a blockage to spread the infection of malignant cells in the lymph nodes. So the goal here is to make sure that all of the interstitial fluid that needs to get out of the body is out of the body and what needs to stay in the body stays in the body and prevent an infection of any of the nodes or the vessels themselves. So structures of the lymph system. Obviously, there's going to be a closed vascular system of endothelial cells lined in tubes that parallel arterial systems and nervous systems. And then there's lymphatic capillaries, which are single-walled, single-layered endothelial cells with fibrils radiating from junctions in the endothelial cells. So you can think of the vascular system, right, as the one that helps carry everything back, which is the vessels. And then you also have your lymphatic vessels, which go alongside the blood vessels, such as the arteries and veins, which help carry the plasma proteins back to the heart to be flushed out. Fibrils support that lymphatic system and anchor them to surrounding connective tissues, such as like veins and muscles. Capillaries are surrounded by interstitial fluid. The lymphatic capillary is called terminal lymphatics, or the end of the lymphatic system, provide an entryway for lymphatic system for excess interstitial fluid and plasma proteins to both transfer to the tissue and then out of the tissue. This is kind of a picture of exactly where lymphatic systems are. Um, the one thing that you want to notice with this is that your major ducts tend to be in the upper region of the body and then also down in the lower region of the body so you can see the large collection of the actual lymph nodes themselves. This can play a problem for patients that have surgeries on the lower limbs which we may deal with. It can also play a problem with patients that may end up with certain conditions such as breast cancer or something to that effect. So collecting vessels in the upper right extremity, head and neck, right and thorax, duct into the right subclavian vein, and collecting vessels from the rest of the body drain through the thoracic duct into the subclavian vein. So one drains into the right and one drains into the left side. Fluid moving in interstitial spaces pushes or pulls on fibrils supporting terminal lymphatics and forcing endothelial cells to gap apart. This basically is the effect of osmosis. So the more fluid that's in the area, the more those vessels are going to try to open up and absorb that. It also needs a place to go. So if there's blockages anywhere in the system, unfortunately, they will back up. Once the interstitial fluids are enter these channels, they become lymph. No tissue activity or interstitial volume increases to take place in these. They remain closed. Muscle activity, active and passive movements, elevated position, all this can help the blood vessels move this lymph back to the So pitting edema is a problem we're going to look into a little bit here. This is localized edema caused by plasma proteins, cellular debris from damaged cells, and overall different problems with that. Pitting edema is going to look like your normal swelling, except when you press down on it, it's not going to return to normal state by pressing down. So it won't normally fill up like a normal capillary refill does. It'll remain indented and look like you have a fingerprint on the area. That on. Um, this actually causes the problems within the area. It's, the fluid becomes sort of a gelatinous matrix. And a lot of patients get worried about this at that point because then they think that the reason they have too much swelling is because they're taking in too much fluid, when in reality the problem is they have too little water taking in and that gel is actually starting to become so thick that it can't return. So that's Lymphedema is if edema causes over distension of lymph capillaries and pores become more ineffective and lymphedema results. So this is a medical condition. You can have primary lymphedema and primary lymphedema is going to be lymphedema that is caused by lymphedema itself. So this is a problem directly with the lymph vascular, vascular system. Secondary lymphedema could be caused by trauma, could be caused by other diseases. This is when the lymphedema itself is going to be caused by some other condition as we've talked about in pathology.
where we, a primary condition is the condition itself, a secondary condition is the condition brought on by another problem. Constriction lymph capillaries or larger lymphatic vessels can also cause this problem. Blockages along the way, so negative effects of edema. Edema is going to compound the extent of injury by causing secondary hypoxic cellular death in the area. So if there's too much fluid in that area, it's not going to allow cells to exchange their gases and also their proteins and all of their nutrients as needed. Again, once fluid collects in the area, the only place that tissue itself can go is in, and the more compression it gets on it, the more cell death occurs. Other problems can happen, physical separation from torn tissue ends, pain, restricted joint range of motion. I talked about this in patho as well. Swelling is really the body's own way of creating a cast. So that means that you know when you get excessive swelling in that area, it's the body's way of protecting that area from motion. It can also cause prolonged recovery times, interstitial fibrosis, and RSD, which we will talk about in past. So what can we do to treat edema? Immediate first aid. So what's the first aid that we're going to do is rice. Rest, ice, compression, and elevation. We can also use electrical stimulation in uh, conjunction with that rest, ice, compression, and elevation, or also use intermittent compression to help return the fluid. Any treatment that encourages lymph flow will decrease plasma protein, increase in cellular space, and decrease edema. So there's our initial control of edema, right? As I said, elevation, compression. We want to do some weight bearing, meaning that we do want the patient to still move around because the muscles contracting will help return that fluid to the body. Here's the wrapping like we demonstrated. Gravity can also use to augment normal lymph fluid. This is gravity-assisted lymph swelling drainage or gravity-assisted fluid retention return. There's all kinds of terms for it. The higher the elevation, the greater effect on lymph flow, meaning that if you elevate it above the heart, you have a greater chance of returning that flow back to the heart. Compression. Rhythmic internal compression provided by muscle contractions helps the normal fluid move back. If there's a problem with muscular contractions or with the vessels, this may not be enough. It may accomplish their isometric activities as well. So oftentimes we may have the patient do isometric contractions while we have their limbs elevated. External pressure can increase lymph flow, massage, and elastic compression garments, intermittent pressure devices, ALPS devices, which we talked about. We can even do something as simple as lymph drainage massage, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the actual massage lecture. Um, all of those are great. But if we don't follow this up with treatment, there's very little that those treatments are actually going to do for the device or for the compression. Here's some great Job's garments. Weight bearing activities. Weight bearing activities help venous or pump return. Uh, one of the biggest things patients may do, especially if they're flying a lot and worried about getting lymphedema, is ankle pumps. Simply pumping the ankles into dorsiflexion and plantar flexion repeatedly, say 10 to 15 times every 30 minutes or so helps release this endothelial derived relaxing factor all right and it just helps mediate the release of it doesn't actually cause it uh, it's liberated by sudden pressure change and it diffuses locally and that'll actually help the smooth muscle stimulate blood flow into the veins meaning that'll open up the vessels and allow more of that permeate cryotherapy can also help it in the acute stage right and post-acute injury can also cure, or help actually in the um in the subacute and also in the chronic phase but only after they've already had some heat to help loosen up that fluid that's become. Uh, in treatment parameters, inflation pressure, we talked about during the lab. We really don't want it to go much over their diastolic pressure. How can we get that? We can take their blood pressure. On off time sequencing. Typically, they're going to go on for 30 seconds, off for 30 seconds, but this will vary by PT orders. And then total treatment time, at least in the hospital setting, patients should be on their compression devices at any time that they're not up and moving. So here's one of those devices. This is actually similar to an ALPS device um, and can also be used to help inflate and deflate it. A pressure approximate diastolic pressure is what I said is going to be most common. Arteriocapillary pressure is about 30 millimeters of mercury. Any pressure that exceeds this would help encourage the release of that factor and also help release the uh, edema in the localized area. Maximum pressure, meaning the most we should ever do, is diastolic blood pressure. I can't beat that in as, as much more than I can. More may not be necessarily better. So think about that when your patient says, well, it doesn't feel like it's squeezing too much. It is squeezing the appropriate amount, and they just need to be educated on that. On-off time, variable, as I talked about. Typically, it's going to be a 30 to 30 time. 
and most times you're going to talk to a PT, they're not going to give you a reason for this. It's just the way it's been done. Total treatment time, significant gains in limb volume reduction after 30 minutes of compression, which means anything less than 30 minutes, we may not get much. 10 to 30 minute treatments does seem adequate, but again, if the edema is overwhelming or a volume or is resistance treatment, meaning it's too thick, 10 to 30 minutes is not going to be enough. For a healthy patient, you could probably get away with 10 to 30 minutes. More treatment times per day is actually really beneficial. So meaning that if your patient's seen for therapy in the morning and they're going to be seen for therapy in the afternoon, if you can get them to have a session of compression post-treatment each time, that actually helps return that fluid, can help overall improve the function of that lymph system. Compression sleeves can either be half leg, full leg, full arm, half arm, depends on what you're looking at. Deflated compression sleeves connect to the compression unit via the hose and the connecting valve. Deflate it up to the pressure that's needed. Uh, treatment time should be adjusted between 30 and 120 seconds. Again, this is where I go back to the fact that most times it's going to be a 30 on, 30 off situation. Off time is less than zero until the sleeve is inflated and then treatment pressure released and it can be adjusted between zero and 120 seconds. So meaning the first pump should pump the fully up before you adjust that off time. And this is mainly so that you can actually check to make sure the patient is tolerating it. You don't have too much pressure on the patient. 30 on, 30 off is what I talked about already, and it should last between 20 and 30 minutes. In the hospital, most doctors prefer it to be about 60 minutes if they can tolerate it. We can combine cold with it. That's what we're going to talk about, the game ready device, and this can actually show to greatly increase the overall effect of compression. Uh, there's all kinds of portable compression units here. It's one of them. The um, Game Ready is another. There's various different Cairo Cup versions out there. Game Ready itself actually now has a thermo unit as well, which is kind of interesting. I'm hoping we can get a so we can try it. Uh, intermittent compression can also be used with low-frequency pulsed or surging electric stimulation, typically high volt, and using currents ionic type properties to drive the fluid back through the body, facilitates the of that fluid. Sequential compression cuffs are, cuffs are awesome. These are ones that are going to start sequentially, usually distally, and slowly inflate distally and work its way proximally. That helps push the fluids a little bit better. Um, and it is better than traditional compression garments, but this can be really useful. The only side effect of this is these devices are typically quite costly. Highest pressure obviously going to be distal, and then it's going to move more proximal as it goes. The goal is to move that fluid up. Uh, with these devices, please be aware that if the patient has any lymph issues with the lymph nodes themselves, you need to clear the lymph nodes first prior to actually providing the actual compression. Uh, length cycle is about 120 seconds. It says here pressure is initially, and then continues pressure for 90 seconds. These are all the parameters of it itself. The main thing you need to know with sequential pressure is that it's going to start distally with a higher pressure and continue to press approximately until it reaches the end of the cuff, such as up here. Intermittent compression is recommended for lymphedema, traumatic edema, chronic edema, swelling, pretty much anything we can think of that, that involves swelling of contraindications. Deep vein thrombosis, because we don't want the, the actual thrombosis to move. Local superficial infection, because again, we can cause that superficial infection to remove. Congestive heart failure. We're going to be forcing this fluid back to the heart. The more we force back to the heart, the greater load we put on the heart, the worse the heart can be. Acute pulmonary edema is also there in dispersions. So here's these contraindications. This would be, in former terms, we used to call this a stump sock. So we now call it a residual limb shaper. This is another garment to help with, and you can see there, there's the patient's knee. So this is a below knee or trans tibial amputation. And the goal of these is to make the residual limb into a shape that we can then afford a prosthetic into. Um, this is patient being wrapped with um, a special type of wrap that we'll talk about when we come to fifth semester, but that's actually kind of a sticky wrap that's going to stay on for a couple days. It's almost a mini cast is the way you could think of it. And the goal is to prevent that fluid. If we can keep the fluid from going back down the leg like it is there, we can potentially stop the swelling entirely. Um, here again, they're just wrapping it with an external wrap, such as an ace bandage, to keep that stuff in. Here's a wrapping with a sponge, I'm assuming, to protect the malleoli. I'm not exactly sure what the condition was for this. So again, we talked about this. When you're wrapping, you always want to wrap distally to proximally, 
You want to keep the pressure lower than their diastolic pressure. And the best thing is, is you're not going to pull, again, this bandage until it is completely transparent. You're pulling it till you feel a stretch, and that's as far as you need to pull it to maintain compression. Uh, here's anti-embolus stocks. Often Job's garments make those. Um, there's also Tet hose and various brands that are out. Here's an upper extremity one, an ex example of intermittent in the hospital. And this is a stockinette. Occasionally when we do these intermittent compressions, especially coinciding with cold, the patients are a little uncomfortable and there's not a protective layer between the skin and the actual compression unit. So we use these stockinettes to help with that cold. Uh, application of the compression.